just studying and reading through and saying, God, show me what you would say. And I, I landed at that Psalm 119, and I was, as I started reading, I started thinking, man, we need a constant reminder that it's all of Him and, and none of us. We need a constant, consistent reminder that God is the one that works in us and accomplishes good works through us. And there's many people that are doers and there's people that are movers and shakers and they like to get things done. But we constantly need to be reminded that the work is His. It's all about Him. It's all about His will and He wills and He does it through us. You know, there's people that are doers and there's people that are the opposite. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm more of the opposite until, until something lights a fire under my fanny. I'm more of the opposite. I'd rather just sit around and do nothing until I get excited or passionate about something. Then I become a doer. So this spiritual kingdom, we, think, we see that things are accomplished more readily and commonly by design by those that are surrendered more so than those that just soldier on. More is accomplished by those that just surrender and let Him work through them and do something powerful than those that just try to soldier on and get it done. Many of us can be stubborn fighters, which is good sometimes. Sometimes it's good to be a stubborn fighter, but not in a supernatural realm where it's not about you and I. We don't bring things to pass by our effort and by our power and by our strength and by our will. So I want to show you a progression and something in the Word that God encouraged me with in Psalm 119. I want to show you a progression starting at verse 30. It's apparent in David's life as we read through the Psalms and we read through the uh, First and Second Kings and we, we, read, we read through Samuel. We read about David's life and about what he went through and what he endured. And there was a definite learning curve in his life. And I started thinking going, no man or woman in this Word was not changed when they walked with him. Amen. They all had to progress. We read about their faults. We read about their shortcomings. We read about them learning. We read about them being enlightened. We read about God doing marvelous things in and through their lives, but not without fault and not without mistake. And God takes them down these roads. And the goal is always to be more like Jesus, isn't it? That's the goal. It's to be more like Jesus. Don't let somebody come on to you and try to sell you something and make this more complicated than it is. The goal is to be like Jesus. That's what it's all about. It's about being like Him. So look at Psalm 119, verse 30. It says, I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I hid before me. 31 says, I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Do not put me to shame. I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I'll observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the paths of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline your ear, or your, incline your heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. Incline my heart. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Establish your word to your servant who's devoted to fearing you. Turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in righteousness. And verse 41 says, Let your mercies come also to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. Now we see these verses. I want to show you something that God showed me. Look at the first three verses, 30, 31, and 32. David writes, and he says, I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments I have laid before me. I have, struck, I have stuck unto thy testimonies, O Lord. Put me not to shame. I will run the way of thy commandments, and when thou shalt enlarge my heart. And I started thinking about these first three verses, 30, 31, and 32. And he's talking about what he has done. He's talking about what he wants to do. He's talking about what he will do for the Lord. And how he is going to choose and run and walk and stick to it. And it's good to make those choices. It's good to have those aspirations that I will stick to your commandments. But in the attaining of them is where we falter. You understand where I'm going with this? I will do it. I will run. I will love your word. 
I'm going to stick to your commandments and your testimonies. David says, I've chosen the way of truth. I've laid them before me. I stuck to your testimonies. I will run the way of your commandments. And he says, you shall enlarge my heart. Meaning, God will make me willing. God will do it in me. I know it's those desires. But again, there's all these eyes. There's all these eyes in verse 31, 30, and 32. And it's not bad in itself to come before the Lord and say, I will do this, or I want this. But how far will you get on I? How far do you think you will run alone? How far do you get in a spiritual, supernatural life and a walk with God with solo effort? Not very far. I'll let you fill in the blank of what you've tried to do with I and failed. You see, these eyes can be just I. They can be selfish eyes. Or they can be eyes that already acknowledge, I know it's you. I know it's you that does it in me. I know that you've taken me there and you're going to take me other places. I understand that. But you see how there are eyes in those first three verses. And he's proclaiming what he's going to do. Turn to John chapter 3. The Gospel of John chapter 3. I don't make you turn around in your Bible very much. So I'm awfully kind to you. But I'm going to make you turn today. Turn to John chapter 3. And look at verse 27, John 3, 27. This is John the Baptist talking. John 3, verse 27. He answers, he said, A man can receive nothing except it's given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I'm not the Christ, but, I, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly. Because the bridegroom's voice, this, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I, or eyes, must decrease. Our eyes must decrease. Philippians says, for it's God that worketh in you both to do and to will to do of his good pleasure. That's what it says. It says that it's God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. In hearing the eyes, we can get the wrong idea. We can put focus on the eyes. And I coined a phrase, and I didn't copyright it, so you can steal it if you want. I was thinking this morning as I was sitting over there, I said, too much focus on eyes, and you'll go spiritually blind. <laughs> too much focus on eyes, and you'll go spiritually blind. And that's what's happening here. But listen how it starts to change. Listen how the feeling and the aura and what David is saying begins to change a little bit. David loved the Lord. God had a lot of work to do on David. He had lots to work to do on us. But listen to how it begins to change. He said, I've chosen the way. I've stuck to your testimonies. I've run the your way of your commandments. And then look at verse 33 in your Bible. And he says, teach me. No more I. It says, teach me the way of your statutes. But then, then I can keep it to the end. Teach me, and I shall keep it to the end. So David, he knows. He says, I know it's you that has to do it in me. You have to teach me. You open it up to me and you make it real to me. You do the work. You illuminate your, your words. You give me revelation. You bring it out. You give me the character and begin to teach me what I need to know. Only when God makes something real is it really real Amen. in the Word. You can read the same Scripture 500 times and it says the same thing. It feels the same way. <clears throat> but then when God comes and He goes like this and He breathes on it for you and He makes it alive, all of a sudden you start dancing around and go, oh my goodness, I never saw that before. Amen. It makes me free. Wow, that's powerful. And you've read it 60 times. But then God simply just illuminates His Word. So David says, teach me. He says, teach me. But then there's that little nagging I that gets postulated at the back end of the sentence. Teach me, and then I can do it. Teach me, and then I can do it. 
Now I see, now you've shown me, now I can do it. But in verse 34, he says, give me understanding also. Give me understanding and I'll keep your law. Give me understanding and I'll keep your law. Give me understanding and I'll observe it with my whole heart. See, there's still eyes there. Don't just teach me. I, I'm starting to see something. I'm starting to see something myself. You need to teach me. And don't just teach me. Give me understanding Amen. that I can observe it with my whole heart. You have to give it to me. I'm starting to see something in my walk with you, God. It's no longer just I can run after it or I can attain it or I can keep your commandments. I'm starting to understand that you need to teach me and give me some understanding yeah. so I can process these things. Because I want to run after your commandments. I want to stick to your statutes. But I need you to teach me. I'm starting to understand something. You need to teach me and give me the knowledge I need to run after you and to keep these things in my heart. I've read lots of books and you've read lots of books and we've done lots of study. But none of those things can substitute the supernatural wisdom that God can give you. The supernatural wisdom that can come from this word. I've told you stories about men and women that I've known that were uneducated people. Dropped out of school, but became mighty students of this word. And knew this word. And it says that when they stood before those that were questioning them, Peter and John, these men have been with Jesus. Aren't these just ignorant, unlearned fishermen? Shouldn't they only know how to bait a hook and throw a net in the water? How come they're explaining to us all these things that should be so far beyond their understanding? Because they've been taught. Because they've been given understanding into the deep things of the Spirit. In Proverbs it says, A wise man will hear and will increase in learning. A man of understanding shall attain to wise counsel to understand a proverb and the interpretation of a thing. The words of the wise and their dark sayings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom, but a fool despises wisdom and instruction. Wisdom. And so David comes, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll run after commands. Okay, but now I need to see. You need to teach me. I need to understand. And this one, I love the next one. Look at verse 35. And this is our life. Sometimes we say, God, I will do this, or I desire you. I have this zeal. I have this passion. I want to run after you. And then things start to happen, and then you start saying, teach me. Then you start saying, God, would you make me understand? And then you get to verse 35, and you just say, make me. Make me. Can you please just make me? Make me go in the path of your commandments. You know, it started out with the eyes, and it started out with, I can do this and I need you and, and I can run this and I'll obey your commandments and I will chosen the way of your truth and I've stuck your testimonies. And then you get to verse 35 and you just look at the Holy Spirit and say, make me, please just make me go in the path of your commandments because I delight in them, because I love them. I've seen something in me now. I've seen a deficiency and a lack in me. And the eyes aren't there anymore. Perhaps I'm not as strong as I thought. So it becomes, oh God, please make me. Lead me the right way. Because I know I want it. I know I delight in your word. You see this? We start off on the right side of the bed in the morning. We get up. The birds are singing in the trees. Your eggs are made just right Everybody's walking around your home, you know, just the praise the Lord's and hallelujahs are flowing out of their mouth and everything's great. And you're cruising through your home and there's a Colgate smile on your face and you're ready to go out the front door. And guess what happens? Something cuts you off at the pass or Satan comes and he throws dirt in your face or somebody's hallelujah is, is with, you know, is not genuine. And then you, and something begins to happen. And then it's, I will walk in your commandments and I understand your testimonies and I want the truth. But then something comes. And then the I have chosen the way of truth and the judgments I have laid before me and I have stuck to your testimonies and I'll run the way of your commandments turn into this. Make me. God, please just make me. Teach me. Give me understanding and please make me go in the paths of your commandments because I delight in them. Is that just me? Is it just me? It's, it's, a, it's a Pentecostal church. You could say amen. It's okay. It's totally allowed. You know, it's not just me. That's how it works in our life. 
you come and, and you read something or God really reveals something to you and then you go, I can do this. I can walk in this. God has shown me something. But through life, we walk through life and then it becomes, God, you got to teach me. You got to give me understanding. And then sometimes it gets so hard that you begin to go, oh God, please just make me. Please make me into what you want to make me into. The title of the sermon is not I, you. Not I, you. But the scripture doesn't stop there. God's teaching doesn't stop there. Amen. God working on David, working on us. The psalmist doesn't stop there because he's really revealing to us in that psalm what he has been shown, what he's been taught, what God has done in his life, how God has brought him up out of miry clay and set his feet upon a rock. How God has made him free and shown him things. In the scripture, as we progress in truth, the word washes us. Look at verse 36. Incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from beholding vanity and quicken me in your way. Establish your word unto thy servant who's devoted to fearing you. Look at those three verses. Where did the eyes go? Where did the eyes go? They're gone. It's no longer I will incline my heart. It's you incline my heart to your testimonies. Not I will turn my eyes away from beholding vanity. It says turn my eyes away from beholding vanity and quicken me. It doesn't say, I have been established in your word. It says, establish your word unto your servant who's devoted to fearing you. Do these things for me because I'm starting to understand only you can. Only you can make a way for me when there seems to be no way. How many naysayers did they have at the Red Sea? You have Moses standing there believing God, knowing he's done it before. He'll do it again. I'm sure you had a lot of grumblers and complainers and tis tists way in the back. How's God going to do this? And it's the same in our lives. It's I will do this. I will go forward. And then it evolves into please teach me. Please make me understand. And then it evolves to make me. And then it evolves to you have to do it. You incline my heart. You turn my eyes away. You establish your word to me. It becomes a plea and a cry in your heart. It's no longer a proclamation. You're crying out to Him. You're no longer making this declaration to Him. It's a plea coming from you. Do you understand that? We come to Him and we try to give Him something and bring Him something. I will do this for you. I will accomplish this for you. And it changes. Life begins to change and God begins to do a work in us. It's, it, then it becomes a cry and a plea. It's not a proclamation. It becomes a cry. It's not an announcement of my transformation. It's the plea of a believing child. I know you're able to do this. And only you can. Yeah. Yeah. I've walked and I've banged my head up against so many brick walls in my life that I go, only you can do it. I'm tired of having a bloody forehead. Only you can do it. It's not I anymore. If you focus on the eyes, you'll go spiritually blind, right? That alone is powerful. He says, I'm devoted to fearing you. It's like he progresses and he shows something in his life. He started with I, and then it comes to devoted to fearing you. And I couldn't help but think about the life of Joseph. Joseph is 17 years old. God gives him dreams and a vision. He gives him a future. He tells him what he's going to do with him, how he's going to use him. And Joseph says, oh, y'all going to bow down to me. Right? And we don't know whether he was arrogant or whether he was heady about it, but I've known a lot of 17-year-olds in my life, so we don't know. Maybe he was pure in it, but... We see this progress and this process and this sanctification go on in Joseph's life. God says, I'm going to do this for you. You're going to be a man in power with authority. And I'm going to use you. And what's the first thing Joseph gets? A pit. A pit. All his brothers chuck him in a pit. And he was lucky. To, not lucky. He was, it was foreordained that he would get the pit instead of death because they wanted death. Yeah. They wanted to kill him. But he got a pit. 
And then God puts him on a throne, right? Nope. Slavery. Then it's slavery. Then he goes from the pit. Then he goes to Potiphar's house and he's a slave. Then he gets the throne, right? Nope. Then he gets prison. And he goes to prison. And we don't hear Joseph ever charge God with wrong. That's the beautiful thing about this story. And Joseph's story of his life is so special because it's one of the few in the word where the man stays true. And God does a work in your life. And part of me believes the Holy Spirit put that story in there just to say, see, see, it can be done. It can be done. We see a lot of failure. Abraham, failure. You know, he makes Hagar and then we have two nations and then his son does the same thing. His son is named Liar and that's what he becomes, Jacob. And we see all these mistakes and all the tribes of Israel, they all make mistakes and Judah does blunders and all these men make mighty mistakes and all the lineage of Jesus Christ, but they all make mistakes. But then we have this gem in Genesis about Joseph's life. And from the time he's given this great and precious promise and maybe coming to his brothers and saying, I, right? Maybe coming to his brothers and saying, I am going to do that. God has done this. He spoke this in I. It goes to all the way 14, 13, 14 years later where he's 30, early 30s. And he looks at his brothers with tears and says, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. No longer I. God did it. God did all of this. And he brought me through. And he taught me. And he gave me understanding. There was times you can't persuade me that there weren't times when he was in the pit and in the prison. He wasn't saying, God, make me. God, make me. I can't do this. You have to give me the strength to go through another day. You think it's fun in prison back then? God, make me. You have to show me. And then he speaks to the the man that's there. Please, when you go out, remember me. Speak to Pharaoh about me when you go out. Remember, it's not fun here. And he doesn't. And it says that they forgot Joseph. And I love in the word that it says God remembered. As if God forgets. God remembered this person. God doesn't forget. Because Joseph said... You meant it for evil. God did this for good. God did it for good. And it's the same in David's life. Everyone around him meant it for evil. You know, they're trying to pin him to a wall with a javelin. They're chasing him around. He's hiding in caves. And and it's all for evil. And everybody's trying to get him. But God meant it for good. God meant it for good to change him and teach him. Something changes. I see something deeper now. This is what I need. I don't need a piece of the Lord. I need all of Him. And it's not about the eyes. Many want this, but the road is long and we are frail. It's not wrong to have desire. It's not wrong to have passion. It's not wrong to come to the Lord and say, I want this. I have this desire. I want to do this for you. That's not wrong. But it's how you get there. The get there's. You don't ride the horse of I to get there. It is all you will do this. I ask you, I want this. I believe this is what you've called. I want to be in your commandments. I want to stick to your statutes. But it's you, not I, you. You do it in me. You show me. You change me. You breathe on me. You speak to me. I love at the end of John when he comes to his disciples and he doesn't say something, but it says he breathed on them. He breathed on them and and said, receive, receive. I breathe on you. I'll give you what you need. Psalm 119 verse 30 says, I have chosen the way of truth. 31 says, I stuck to your testimonies. 32 says, I've run the way of your commandments. And then 33 says, wait a second, teach me. And then 34 says, give me understanding. 35 says, oh God, make me. Go in the path of your commandments. And then 36 says, incline my heart. 37 says, turn my eyes away from vanity. And 38 says, establish your word to me. I'm devoted to fearing you. And then in 39, something changes again. Something changes in his heart again. 
He says, turn away my reproach, which I fear, for your judgments are good. Behold, I've longed for your precepts. Quicken me in righteousness. The word reproach in Hebrew means shame and disgrace and rebuke. Now, in the light of the new covenant, when we see reproach, you know what that is? That's everything outside of the blood. It's what you try to bring to him that's outside of the blood. You try to bring some effort, something of yourself to try to please him. It says in the word that all of it is just filthy rags. All your righteousness is just filthy. It's filthy. It's disgusting in his sight. You can study what that really means in the Hebrew, and it's even yuckier. It's gross. I don't want to see it. That's not what we bring. We don't bring our eyes before him. What we bring is the blood of his son. Turn away my reproach, which I fear. And it's almost like when he gets in verse 39. Turn away my reproach, which I fear. It's almost like he's looking back on the eyes. Oh, that's a reproach. I'm not going to bring that to you. Bring myself to you. Bring anything that I have to offer to you. It's not I, it's you. I'm here because of you. It's the blood. It's you that wills. To, it's you that gives me the will. It's you in me to do of your good pleasure. All the times I have failed. And even the reproach, you know, the devil loves to come and lie. Demonic forces love to come and lie and magnify the flesh and magnify failures. And you'll begin to see that reproach. And it won't be I that can redeem the reproach. When he begins to magnify your flesh or magnify your faults or show where you have screwed up or where you didn't follow through or whether you let God down. And he'll begin to magnify it. And it's a reproach. And he comes and he says, but your judgments are good. Your judgments, the way you see me, is good. Your word is good. You will do it. Behold, I've longed for your precepts, your truth, your word. Quicken me in your righteousness. That word quicken means to just be made alive, to be revived, to be picked up, to be set on the right path. A reproach can be kind of a, a slap in the face. And there's a cry again. He says, quicken me. It's a cry from his heart. Quicken me. Revive me. Cause me to live. Nourish me. Repair me. Save me. Make me whole. Because it's not I. It's you. And then in verse 30, 41, he says, let your mercies come also to me, O Lord. I think it's powerful. I think it's amazing how he starts out in verse 30. I've chosen. I claim. I'll run the course to verse 41 where he says, I need your mercy. I just need your mercy. You know, one of my most favorite people in the world, my pastor in Arizona, and he is a powerful man of God. He's walked with the Lord so long, and he's, he's an amazing pastor. And he told me one time, I've never forgot this. I, I've never told him this, but I never forgot he said this to me one time. He, I, we were talking about spiritual things, and just how we go to prayer and what we say. He said, you know, for the past few years, I just come before the Lord, and I begin my prayers like this. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I'm going, what? He's just like, we're, we're all just, we need his mercy. We're just sinners at our best. And it's all him. All the good is him. All that he does, it's through him. And he said, I just come to him and say, have mercy on me. Just help me. I was just, and it impacted me so greatly. Instead of coming before the Lord and, you know, standing up and yelling and making demands and, Oh, God, move the, shake the foundations of the earth and do this or that. Mm -hmm. Just have mercy on me, God, and help me to be a good shepherd. It's powerful. You can start your day as an I, but by God, you end your day with a you. Amen. 
right? Yeah. End your day with a you. And that's, that's really where God is taking each and every one of us. To a place of self-dependency, a place of self uh, just trust and we lean upon the arm of flesh to a place where we go it's all you if there's any good it's of you remember in our Bible study in James every good and perfect gift is from the Father above every good thing all the good things are of him the sinners walk around and have a good thing I know where it came from the devil doesn't give them good things Satan doesn't have good plans for them. Only the Lord does. Amen. I hope that encourages you. That the Lord will teach you and take you through that process. And he's faithful to do it because it's his work. Amen. 